Welcome to the Wear, Wag, Repeat podcast. I'm Tori Mystic, here with my dogs, Lucy and Bert. Together, we're interviewing cool, creative women entrepreneurs in the pet industry. Do you dream of working alongside your dog? Then sit, stay, and listen to the latest episode to find the inspiration and resources that will help you grow your own dog-inspired business. On this episode, we're talking a lot about pet wellness and nutrition. Do you include probiotics and phytoplankton in your dog's diet? Listen to find out why you should. All this advice and much more is coming from Amanda, who owns a natural pet food store and offers holistic pet wellness consultations. We'll also talk about why it's so important to stay authentic in the pet business. Let's dive in. Amanda Rose is a mom, pet parent, business owner, and podcaster who is obsessed with all things pet wellness and nutrition. She helps pet owners improve the lives of their companions by sharing knowledge about healthier food alternatives, chemical-free cleaning options, compassionate training, emotional mindfulness, and much more. She's written articles for several pet health magazines, including Dogs Naturally Magazine and Healthful Dog. Amanda lives in Alberta. Canada with her partner Travis and their toddler, along with three dogs, two cats, and one horse. (laughs) Hey, Amanda. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm so excited. I'm so excited to have you on the show. So we're both dog mom podcasters. Mm -hmm. So I'm really excited to be interviewing like a peer sort of in this space. And everyone who's listening to this episode right now, uh, next week, you can tune in to Amanda's podcast, which is called Holistic Pet Radio. And I'm going to be on her show. So we're kind of doing like a little interview swap. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be very fun. Why don't you tell us, um, obviously the name Holistic Pet Radio gives us a lot of clues as to what you're into, but how did you get into holistic pet wellness? Because that's, you know, you know, we all want our dogs to be healthy, but holistic is sort of a specialty. So how did you get into that? Yeah. So it's kind of a long story, but not really, but kind of. So it all started when I was probably around 10 years old. I had two basset hounds named Bonnie and Clyde. They were brother and sister. And when I say I had, they were our family pets, obviously. And the older, well, I guess they were siblings, but the, um, I think of him as older because he died sooner. Clyde, the brother, um, he actually passed away at around eight years old of old age. Is what the vet did. And, um, just, they always had health conditions. They always kind of smelled like your typical or what you think of as typical kind of musty dog smell. They just didn't have good coat quality. They shed a ton. They had a lot of health issues. So that prompted my mom after Clyde passed away, she was really upset and she started kind of doing some research and she came across one of Ian Billinghurst's book. She read, give your dog a bone. And then she read his other one. And I'm completely blanking on the name right now. Oh, Barf, the Barf Diet or whatever. So she read his books, which were written in the early 90s. And so she read them kind of in the early 2000s, I guess. So that prompted her to switch our remaining dog, Bonnie, onto raw food. And then we got a puppy and we put him on raw food, all basset hounds. And so I've been around raw feeding specifically for years, for a very, very long time. So I don't even know how long that is now. 15 years. Wow. Um, Quick math in my head. So that kind of predisposed me to look into kind of holistic pet rearing already. And then um, as time went on, I went through university. So I guess backtracking a little bit, I went into animal science in university, was like, I'm going to be a vet. This is what I want to do. I'm really passionate about the nutrition side of things. I want to do this. Did two years and it just wasn't the right fit for me. Um, just the dynamic wasn't for me. Some of the teachings I wasn't, you know, hundred percent on. So I switched to English and said, okay, animals are going to be my hobby, um, my passion. I'm not going to work with them though. And then I got involved in animal rescue and was like, okay, I'm going to do animal rescue. That's what I'm going to do. So kind of bounced all over the place. And then going through, I realized, no, I I really want to work with animals. So my partner, Travis and I were looking to kind of get into business when I was kind of wrapping up my degree. And, um, he was looking at a ton of businesses that did not relate to pet the pet world whatsoever. And I was like, you know what? I want to do something related to pets. Can we do something related to dogs? And so we looked at this business. I was like, I want a job where I can bring my pets to work with me. And so long story short, we bought a holistic pet, or not a holistic, I guess, a natural pet food store kind of went from there. And then holistic pet radio kind of 
came out of that because I felt like I was having a lot of the same conversations with my customers that were coming in all the time. We were dealing with things like transitioning from diet, allergies, hotspots, you know, just a ton of different things. And so I created Holistic Pet Radio really in the beginning, just as kind of a bank of information to send my customers to. And then it started to grow into just connecting with people around the world and me turning it into kind of an online business, if you will, as well. Yeah. So that's really cool. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, totally. I love how you kind of like went in and out of trying to get into the pet business, but you ultimately ended up where uh, it seems like you were meant to be. Yeah, I think so. So I love that, you know, I I think you can't go on any kind. I'm in so many dog communities online and especially on Facebook. There's so many dog groups and they all have people asking about nutrition and so many people are giving their opinions and I try to kind of stay out of it, (laughs) but you can't help but see that it's going on even if you aren't chiming in at all. So Mm -hmm. like, what are some of the top questions that you're getting from customers or that you're addressing? with people through holistic pet radio? So I think a big one would be raw feeding in general. I just get lots of questions about why people are raw feeding. Is it a good fit for them? How do you transition to raw feeding? How do you make sure your food is balanced? That is probably the number one. And then the number two would be sensitivities or what we're looking at as allergies, but usually they're just the sensitivity and skin conditions and stuff like that. So those would kind of be the biggest ones. In terms of raw feeding... I I really like your point about you, you see it going on, but you don't necessarily want to chime in in a lot of the groups. I've been ki- kicked out of a couple raw feeding groups, <laughs> even that I'm super aggressive. Just like in one group, I mentioned adding fermented fruits and or vegetables basically into the food. And they were like, oh, we don't support giving dogs vegetables. You're out of the group. What? Yeah, it gets kind of heated sometimes. So I really try to have HPR be a, a safe place to talk about anything. I, you know, I accept people for where they're at in their journey. And I also think that as long as we're all just doing the best we can for our pets, then that's awesome. I don't, I'm not one of those people who's like, you have to feed raw, or you're not doing, you know, whatever. That's not really my game. Cause I don't think that helps people at all. Yeah. In terms of the questions people ask about raw feeding. I mean, it's kind of a, it's a broad topic, right? There's so many different things. The biggest thing I always advocate for is education. Make sure you're doing your research. Or if you can't do your research, find a holistic or integrated veterinarian who can work with you. Or at the very least, find you know a local boutique pet food store where someone has bought into that store, has purchased that store because they're passionate about nutrition, and let them be your resource. And then always, obviously, do your own research, but at least they give you a jumping off point. So do you have any recommendations on how to find a vet that is open to these kinds of things? Because you know a lot of vets nothing against vets, but just a lot of them I think are a little bit old fashioned style and it's hard to find someone when you want to pursue alternative treatments and ways of life. So how do you find someone like that? Yeah. So I actually, I have a whole podcast episode called how to talk to your vet, which is kind of geared towards people who maybe there's only, you know, one conventional vet in their area. And so that's kind of geared towards them if anyone wanted to listen to it. And it just talks about, you know, just having a respectful relationship, but also I always advocate. I always, always say that people need to be the leader of their pet's healthcare team. It is our jobs as their guardians to know what is going on their bodies and in their bodies and what medical decisions are being made for them. It doesn't mean you have to have a degree in you know, veterinary science, but at least doing some background checking and figuring out what's going to be a good fit for your pet. I'm a big advocate of in terms of finding a vet. I, and I've talked about this before too. I think the big thing is have an interview with your vet. You know, they're a professional that you are hiring to do a service for you essentially. So you have every right in my mind. And I mean, I would call ahead and always be, you know, polite and nice and everything, Mm -hmm. but book a consultation appointment. Don't bring your dog, walk in, bring two cups of coffee and talk to them and see if you're on the same level. Cause you really want to find someone who's open-minded. They don't have to know everything about raw feeding to work with you. They don't have to know everything about holistic medicine, but you want to find someone who's at least open-minded and who's willing to hear out your side of what you'd like to try with your dogs and, you know, have that relationship with you. I'm a big relationship person. So that would probably be my advice. Also in terms of actually finding a physical place, the ahvma.org, you can search holistic vets in your area. Oh, as well. cool. Oh, that's great to know. Because years ago, um, with one of my, my old dogs who passed away like two and a half years ago, I um, 
she she had a lot of arthritis and just general problems and I ended up finding a holistic vet but it was like an hour drive from my house and we would go there for acupuncture and she even did like this infrared laser treatment and she would recommend like Chinese herbs and she recommended a raw diet and at the time we were doing the Honest Kitchen um, the freeze dried raw powder that you rehydrate because it was really convenient. But she, this was just probably four or five years ago when I first started seeing her, and that was one of the first times that I learned about any of these kinds of things. So the regular vets that I've been going to for years and years never really recommended anything like that. So it's really neat to go and see someone who's an expert in that and just can kind of make different recommendations that you might not know about. A hundred percent. And I always say with kind of alternative, if you will, or holistic medicine, I find that the more you learn, the more you learn, you don't know. Like there, it is such a huge world of just tools for your toolbox for helping your pet. There's so much out there. Yeah. So, okay. So we've talked so much about like pet nutrition and, and being an advocate for your pet, which is so important, but I'm kind of curious about how you've turned this whole passion into a business. Um, so of course you have the pet food store. So maybe you can tell us a little bit about that and how it kind of complements the health consultations and the podcast and everything else that you do. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's a great question. So to start off with, I guess when I first started, I did not make much money from it at all. Um, if any, um, really we started with the brick and mortar pet food store and that was kind of the mainstay of our income and our business. My partner quit his job. He's still a freelance graphic designer, but he's in the store now that I've had a baby, he's in the store actually a lot more than I am. So we started with that. And for anyone working in a brick and mortar pet food store, you know, that that is a journey in and of itself because the the overheads are huge. Like you have to have a lot of inventory price margins on pet food are not great. So it is one of those balancing acts you have to figure it out. And it's just a time as you build consistent customers. So that was a big one. And the biggest thing with the store for me was education. I wanted to be able to help almost everyone who walked in through the door. If they had a question about their pet's health, I wanted to either be able to have the answer, have my staff have the answer or have them trained in how to find the answer and help that person kind of facilitate helping making their dogs better. That was the core of what I wanted to do and what I want to do. So that was kind of the pet food store. And then, like I was saying earlier, Holistic Pet Radio kind of just was a natural progression from that. Um, And it was really just a bank of information in the beginning for my customers. I was not looking at it as like, this is going to be this podcast that I'm going to grow and scale. I was like, I'm going to record this information. I'm going to give people the link when they come in talking about allergies. I am a very fast talker (laughs) and it's something I have to work on. So I was like, if I record it, because when people come into the store and they want information, I would at them so fast. I think they couldn't process everything sometimes. So it was a nice reminder. I'd be like, go listen to the podcast. I talk a lot slower. You can understand. You can remember what I was saying. And that's kind of why and how it came about. And then in terms of making money from it, it's still something, honestly, I'm learning. Yeah. Not the mainstay of my income whatsoever. And I'm, it's, it's a line that I'm trying to walk because I get a lot of requests for people to sponsor the podcast, but they're not necessarily businesses that I would be comfortable recommending. So that comes into that whole discussion of like, how do you monetize things without, you know, not selling out, but that right. kind of idea. You have to stay authentic. Exactly. So that's been a challenge for me. So I'm trying to figure that out. Um, and then there's this new feature where you can just monetize kind of like YouTube and you put random ads in the middle mm-hmm. and that of your podcast. And that's something I'm kind of avoiding because, you know, I'm worried. What if they run an ad for like Royal Canin in the middle of my podcast? And then it kind of just takes away from the authenticity. And then in terms of nutrition consultations or and I shouldn't say nutrition, they're wellness consultations. Mm-hmm. Again, it just kind of is for people who, so for the podcast, For people who are local to me, I always encourage them to just come to my store, come talk to me, come talk to the staff, we'll book an appointment, and I don't charge for those consultations. Mm -hmm. So the way that works is obviously you give people information in the hopes that you gear them towards products that they will then purchase from your store. When I'm working online, I get a lot of questions from people who want me to help their dogs, and I, I'm a, honestly, I give away, not give away, but I give away a lot of free information because I just want to help people's pets. If they ask me a question, I'm going to answer you anyways. But if they're more in depth, I try and direct people towards the consultation so I can really give directed information. And so that is kind of just for the people who aren't in my area, honestly. If you're in my area, come to the store. If you're not in my area and you still want help, that's where the wellness consultation kind of works for those people. Sorry to interrupt the interview, but I would love to see what you're doing while you catch up with the Wear Wag Repeat podcast. 
take a screenshot of this episode in your podcast player or snap a selfie with your earbuds in. Bonus points if it's on a dog walk and share it to your Instagram stories tagging me at tmystic. I'll keep an eye out for mentions and I would love to give you a shout out from my own account. Okay, now back to the episode. I think it's such a cool concept because you found a way for your brick and mortar store to have an online, you know, virtual business component, even if it's just kind of starting out and just starting to grow. I think it's just such a creative way to sort of extend your reach and sort of like diversify, you know, your income streams and what you can charge for. And and what's really wonderful about it is that when you give these wellness consultations and you're recommending products to people and brands to people, they're probably only available at other local pet retailers. So right. like when it comes down to it, you're really like supporting other local businesses around the world. So I just think it's, it's really cool. And it, I mean, it really is a very holistic <laughs> approach <laughs> to doing everything. <laughs> yeah. I guess one thing I should also mention about the, the brick and mortar pet food store that we own, it actually is a franchise. Oh, that- Canada. So that was an interesting decision for us. So I don't know, business side, if you want to talk about that a little bit. Yeah. How did you decide to do a franchise instead of doing your own store? Yeah. I don't know anything about really franchises. So this is interesting. And a lot of people don't know that because the way it's, it's called bone and biscuit. So I own the one, the location in Leduc, Alberta. So the way it worked, I looked at a ton of franchises and the reason being was, Although my partner, Travis, he's, he went through business school. He was functioning in like an office job. I'd never owned a business. I have my family are kind of entrepreneurial, but I was not ready to jump in and start my own business from the get-go. So we looked at franchises because they have an established name and they kind of set you up. Honestly, they help with everything. They help figure out where you're buying your freezer from, who you're going to rent through, like all of these different things. They kind of help facilitate us. And I was 21 at the time we bought the store. So it was a lot to kind of take in and process. And was it so, an existing store that existed no. or, okay, you, you just, you f- kind of found the building and worked yeah, with the company to franchise. Them. Yeah. They did not have a location on the Duke. They actually weren't even thinking about having a location where I am. I saw the town and looked around and was like, I want a store here. Can we put a store here? And they said, yes. So the reason we went with this franchise is because I don't know how much you know about pet franchises, but some of them are very set in stone. You have to sell live animals. You have to sell all the the products on their list. You have no kind of personal input. And to me, that was not something I was interested in. So everyone that I called, I was like, is there wiggle room on what we carry? And if they said no, I said, okay, thank you very much. I'm not interested. So I picked a franchise that really allowed me to still have kind of that creative control of what products we stock so I could really maintain that quality. So that was kind of how we went about that. Obviously having a franchise, I mean, there's pros and cons, right? Because you're paying a franchise fee, but you're also having that recognized name and you have a a team to fall back on if that's going on. So it's pros and cons. Right. And you have some, some resources and probably some pre-existing systems that they've created to help you and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. So that's something a lot of people don't know that it's a franchise and it's not like I'm running around advertising it necessarily because they're designed to be kind of ma and pa neighborhood stores, but they're also their franchise. So it's kind of cool. Yeah. It's like the best of both worlds, I guess. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So can you tell us more? You mentioned like earlier in the episode about, you know, suggesting people put fermented vegetables in their dog's food and, and kind of stuff. So you, and also in your, in your brick and mortar store, you carry, you know, you wanted to carry your own pro- or products that you wanted to carry that weren't necessarily on like the pre-approved list. So obviously you must have some favorites. So <laughs> what uh-huh. are some of your favorite superfoods and supplements that you recommend people give to their pets? Sure. So I have a lot because if you've ever shopped in a pet food store or anywhere online for pets, you know, there's like a million options out there for pets, supplements, pet health, like there's so much. And that's something I'm really passionate about is digging into kind of finding the best of the best. What are some good options? What's available in people's areas? So I love doing the consultations because I get to see what's available to people in every area. Right. Yeah. Well, I think it's good to have like your ideal list of what you want, but you have to be realistic sometimes. Like, so for me, feeding raw just isn't realistic. Like, a hundred percent true raw is not realistic, but I love to incorporate as many healthy add on things as I can to kind of boost it up and make it better. So, so go on and tell us, tell us what your favorites are so that then I can go buy them today. (laughs) (laughs) Sounds good. Okay. The first one would be definitely probiotics. I'm such a huge advocate of probiotics. There's a ton of studies being done on the micro, um, the microflora of the gut, 
all these different things are super important to immunity health, as well as just kind of overall general well-being. If they've been linked to behavior and mood, having healthy gut bacteria, super important. So you want to look for a high quality probiotic. You don't want any fillers in it. You want to look for one that has a really high CFU count, which means the colony forming unit count. So it's basically how many are going to hopefully make it through the digestive process and set up a colony in the gut and kind of be established. What is a high CFU count? So a good, uh, the products, I have a couple favorites. They're looking around like 30 billion CFU plus. So quite high. And you want to look for multiple strains of bacteria. I did actually write a whole article for Dogs Naturally magazine called Why You Shouldn't Give Your Dog Portiflora which is the one that most vets recommend. So I would just recommend doing your research before picking a probiotic because there are a lot of products on the market that are not going to give you the amount of like live bacteria that you actually need. And you also want to look for one with a prebiotic in it. Okay. So I'll tell you my favorite product as of right now, and this might change. One of them is Love Bugs by the Adored Beast Apothecary. I know they did actually just come out with a new probiotic, so I'm going to see how that one goes. But as of right now, Love Bugs by the Adored Beast is one of my favorite. If you can get it, it's awesome. Also, just like fermented, fermented foods are great sources of probiotics. Um, So stuff like your, and then also raw goat's milk. Mm -hmm. Kefir, give and feed a healthy bacteria colony. So that's one. (laughs) I have lots. So I'll, I'll just try and keep it short. Phytoplankton is another one. I'm such a huge fan of phytoplankton. When it kind of hit the market, I feel like a lot of people hadn't heard of it before. I've never heard of phytoplankton before. Okay. So what phytoplankton is, they're basically, they're single-celled organisms, and they form the base of pretty much all food chains that exist in bodies of water. It's what, you know, everyone going up the food chain, someone starts with phytoplankton, and someone eats someone, and blah, 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 right? It goes all the way up. They're really amazing for, they're actually what fish eat to get their omega-3 content. That's how fish get omega-3s. It's primarily from the phytoplankton that they're eating. They're amazing for their DHA and their EPA content. They have lots of vitamins, they have trace minerals, they have chlorophyll, they have antioxidants, they have carotenoids, all these different things. They're awesome. And if you get a good quality one, it's a really clean source of omega-3s because a big concern with eating stuff like fish oil is your heavy metals, toxicity, rancidity, all these different things. Phytoplankton, if it's done properly, like grown and filtered Atlantic seawater, they're not only environmentally sustainable, they're a really, really great superfood to give to your pets. And it's a powder. You give like a 16th of a teaspoon to every animal. So it's really nice. They do smell very fishy. It does smell very fishy. It's a powder, um, but it's awesome. So that would be a really big one as well, because I see a lot of people giving fish oil and I'm always like, have you ever tried phytoplankton? You might want to try mixing it in. Very cool. The other thing I'm an advocate of just in general is whole fresh food as much as you can adding in, you know, bell peppers after you're cutting them, blueberries, like all these different things, add them into your pet's bowl as well. That's really important. And then I have two more that I'll do really quickly. (laughs) No, that's okay. Take your time. You talk really fast. So you do get a lot in. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry. Tell me if I'm going too fast. No, you're good. You're good. Like, like you said, everyone can kind of like rewind and listen again. Yeah. I'll put it in half speed and then they can understand me. (laughs) Um, so the other one would be whole rabbit ears and feet. If you can get them frozen, cool. If not, get them dehydrated. That's how I do it. And they have the hair on them and the hair is a really, really great source of manganese and fiber. So that's a really good one. Whole kind of gross. rabbit ears and feet. Okay. Yeah. 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 There's a couple of brands that make them now on the market. Um, they're kind of gross in the beginning, but they don't have a smell, which is nice. And once you get over the, like touching their little toes, it's fine. <laughs> totally. I know. I know. <laughs> And then the other one is oysters. Oysters are a big one. Um, Steve Brown, the pet food formulator, he's a big advocate of oysters. You can give them raw if they're like fresh and, Mm -hmm. you know, nothing's been done to them. Or you can steam them a little bit. Or if you're giving canned, they're fine. Just look for a can that is packed in water only and a BPA-free lining, obviously. And then they're a great source of manganese and zinc, copper, iodine. A lot of these trace elements that we're maybe missing in our pet's diet, they're a great source of that. So those are kind of my big ones. I mean, there's a million other options, but those are some some main ones. That's awesome. I actually remember, I don't know if the Honest Kitchen still makes them, but they had a dried mussel mm-hmm. treat and, and my dogs, I mean, they just loved them, but they were really easy to give because they're, because they're dehydrated. So it was really easy. Yeah. yeah. Anything you can find in dehydrated form. I'm such a huge fan of like oysters, the rabbit feet, anything like that. Cause they're convenient, right? They're shelf stable. You can put them in your pantry and give them right. you know, on a daily basis. 
Oh, well, I'm very excited to go down to my pantry when we're done with this and look, because I have some goat's milk things, and I have some thing that it's like C something or another, S-E-A-C, um, and I wonder if it has those phytoplankton kind of uh, in it yeah. somehow. You more so typically kelp won't have phytoplankton in it. it. I mean, you read the label, but phytoplankton usually is sold like on its own. On to my its own. Yeah, yeah. Kelp is also a great source of like a lot of different vitamins, minerals, iodine, obviously. But one note with kelp, just to tell you, you want to look for always kelp with standardized iodine content because there are actually some subspecies of kelp that have zero iodine content. So you're not actually supplementing for what we usually are looking for. Always, you just want to check the label. This is very interesting. Well, I think this is so wonderful because um, all of us, everyone who's listening to this is somehow in the pet industry and you probably want your pets to live as long as possible so they can be side by side, be your companion, but also so that you can continue to work together. I mean, my whole business is based off of my dog, so I want them to be around for a really long time. So speaking of dogs, I know you have pets other than dogs. But really, mm-hmm. I only care about the dogs. So, <laughs> so tell me about your your three dogs and what makes them so awesome. Well, I think they're great. I think they're the best dogs ever, don't we all? Mm-hmm. Our own dogs are always like they're the best. Um, so they all came to me from kind of different circumstances. They're all girls, um, and they are kind of a variety. So I guess I'll run through them. We'll go smallest to biggest. Okay. So um, Bear is my. She's about four and a half. She's a Chihuahua Jack Russell mutt they're all rescues also so she was a dumpster puppy she was found at a dump ended up as my foster puppy and um i very very quickly foster failed her she was like four pounds little ball of like oh so cute so (laughs) that's how she came to me she's amazing i love her to pieces because of the jack russell in her she's very smart but also very cunning and wily so that's kind of bare um she's my snuggle bug and then Allie is my next one she's a Honestly, on age, we're completely guessing. I'm pretty sure she's around 14 because she was around seven when I adopted her and I've had her for seven years. Mm -hmm. So she's 14-ish. She, You could not tell most days. She does so well. I adopted her from my local shelter when I was volunteering there. Kind of, She was the first dog I adopted also. And she's a Rhodesian Ridgeback Coonhound cross-ish. And I I did this all based on kind of DNA testing because they're all mutts. So we're we're guessing, kind of going on the DNA test, right? So she is, yeah, she's my senior girl. She's awesome. She came to me fully trained. Like she could sit, lay down, roll over, shake a paw. And she kind of gave me a false impression of like what adopting rescues, not false impression, but I'll tell you why for Brandy is my next story. But yeah, well, I think that's kind of what's happened with me with Bert is like, he's just really good. Like after having him for like one or two weeks, I was able to let him off leash in the woods. And so I think I've also been spoiled. (laughs) That's how it goes. So then, so I had Allie and Allie was like that. And then I adopted Brandy. And I love her to pieces. She's about 75 pounds. She's a husky, Samoid, shepherd, mutt. And she came to me with extreme separation anxiety, but there was no mention of it in her adoption bio, really. I mean, they might have that subtle hint, like, I don't like to be alone. But I didn't know what separation anxiety was at the time, so I was very naive. And having just adopted Allie, I thought, oh, this is easy. They sit, lay down, roll over. They, they do it all. It's perfect, right? Right. That was not the case with Brandy. She was the kind of dog who she's ripped out of every kennel we've ever tried. She would, like, claw at doors until her nails were bleeding. She was she just worked herself into a fit. Six Aww. years later, she's a ton. Like, she's amazingly better. But she was kind of um, – she's been my biggest learning curve, I think. And she's I think she came to me to teach me how to manage those kind of things in her and in myself. So she's been really great. So – she is great. She, because of the husky in her, she likes to pull a kick sled. We do lots of really active things. She keeps me really active. So oh, very cool. those are my dogs. <laughs> oh, they sound like quite the little pack and like all kind of very different too, which is awesome. Yeah. Yeah. They're very unique. <laughs> well, Amanda, it was so awesome talking to you. I loved hearing about everything you're doing. You're such an expert in pet wellness. Mm-hmm. Everyone, please go subscribe to her podcast. And like I mentioned next week, I'll be on your show. Yes. So everyone look for that episode as well. And Amanda, just remind everyone where they can find you so they can learn more about what you do. Sure. So everything kind of social media wise is under Holistic Pet Radio. So I'm on Instagram at Holistic Pet Radio. That's kind of my biggest platform social media wise. And then my website is holisticpetradio.ca. So you can check me out there. That's where the consultations are and all of the blogs and transcripts for my podcast also go up there. 
And if someone wants to come see you in person at the store, what is the store called again? So we're the Bone and Biscuit, and we're located in Leduc, Alberta. We're in Leduc Common. If you're in the area, just Google us. We'll come up. You'll see my face. Road trip. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely come up, bring Bert and Lucy. It'll be fun. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. I can't wait to go live again next week with you. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Wear Wag Repeat Podcast. You can fetch show notes at wherewagrepeat.com. If you like what you hear, please hit subscribe so you don't miss an episode. And until next time, we'll see you around the dog park.